Well, so, yeah, welcome everybody uh, to this talk. We're going to be diving into, as the title suggests, Secure Python ML. We're going to be looking at this from the lens of, uh, you know, bad practice, i.e. major security vulnerabilities uh, that we can find throughout the end-to-end uh, -end ML life cycle and also how to avoid them. Uh, there's going to be a lot on this talk, uh, but fortunately there's uh, practical resources. We're going to be delving into a hands-on demo um, so you can find the slides uh, at the top right corner here, uh, so bit.ly uh, secure ML. So let's dive straight into it. Uh, a little bit about myself. Uh, my name is Alejandro. I'm engineering director at Selen Technologies. Uh, we're a open core machine learning deployment and monitoring um, startup. So we develop one of the most popular machine learning deployment frameworks in Kubernetes. Uh, I'm also chief science at the Institute for Ethical AI, uh, where we focus on contributing uh, to frameworks that ensure the responsible design, development, and operation of machine learning systems. Uh, and I'm also governing con uh, council member at large at the ACM. So, um, yeah, as I mentioned, this is a very practical talk. So we are going to have uh, resources in this uh, repository, which you will be able to find. So this is the Jupyter Notebook that we will be using throughout. Uh, so if you do want to dive deeper into any of the areas, you can try it yourself. Um, so, yeah, and if you find any improvements, please do uh, add a PR. So let's take a step back and understand the motivations uh, and the approach that we're going to take for this topic, uh, the topic of uh, machine learning security. So one of the key interesting things is that the security challenges in the, in the DevOps and traditional software space uh, are very um, uh, actively explored. There's a lot of resources around them. Um, however, uh, the key challenges in machine learning itself are still being explored. So there's a lot of content around how to use machine learning in security, things like spa spam detection, malware detection, but best practices of security in machine learning, um, at least from, from what, what we have found is not, is not as uh, uh, defined. Um, and for, for that, what we want to make sure is that this talk is more of a call to action for us as practitioners to, ex to continue exploring the best practices. The way that we're going to approach this is in a similar way to how it's approached in just general security, basically with the principle that it's impossible to make systems unhackable, right? But it's possible to mitigate undesired outcomes through introducing best practices. And one thing that we have to remember is that even though the solutions will be largely technical, uh, in nature, they, you know, they're always is going to be relying in humans and process, right? When it comes to security, uh, you know, you may create a system that is like, you know, uh, highly robust with minimal vulnerabilities, but, you know, the, the, the humans are still going to be involved there, uh, and there can still be a potential for social engineering that, that can open loop, loopholes. So we're going to be also talking about this concept called MLSecOps, which is now a growing uh, new buzzword. Uh, which basically is the, the, the intersection of DevOps, uh, SecOps, and MLOps, uh, is taking uh, you know, uh, the extension of, of DevOps with security, uh, but uh, machine learning as a first-class citizen, uh, and specifically the infrastructure that, that is enabled uh, to make sure that, that um, it's enforced, right? that you have best practices on, on the security lifecycle. And you know, th this is not a, a very general talk. We're going to dive specifically in the security side, but uh, let's take a step back and also remember why production machine learning is so hard, right? Uh, to think about this in, a, in an intuitive way, we're bringing in all of the challenges that we face in the traditional software world, but we're adding and sprinkling the machine learning on top, right? The challenges that you have when dealing with um, you know, specialized hardware and the scheduling of the specialized hardware, whether it's GPUs, TPUs, uh, large amount of memory, etc. You also have complex data flows, right? You, you, you have not just a single machine learning model, but you have machine learning systems. And you have uh, co components that may affect other components down the stream or up the stream. Uh, similarly, there's dependencies of the data as it flows through the system. And then that actually boils down into the next part, which is reproducibility of components, right? There is a challenge to make sure that whenever you want to rerun a specific you know, inference request, you may need to make sure that all of the components are atomic and are reproducible, you know, whether it's today or, or in a couple of weeks. And finally is the compliance requirements and the burden that it brings uh, for, for the practitioners that are very use, use case specific. Now, when it comes to the security side, uh, we've actually, uh, we're actually going to be able to leverage a lot of the resources that have been created in the general software space. So similar to a lot of the machine learning engineering best practices that are being introduced in data science, 
we are also going to be able to take that approach in the security world. And one of the um, you know, great resources is this resource called the OWASP Top 10. Uh, this is basically a report that comes out every year that highlights uh, some of the open web application security you know, project uh, 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 highlights the top 10 most, uh, the top 10 highest vulnerabilities in the web space. So you can see things like you know, broken access control, cryptographic failures, uh, injection. So remember this list, just because by the end of this talk, we're going to have a list similar to this, but specific to machine learning. So uh, again, you know, this talk is not, not specifically about machine learning deployment. Um, so we're not going to be delving into, into the details of that. But we are going to be carrying out the, the, the training, packaging, productionization, and, and inference of, of, of machine learning model. There's going to be a little bit of a hand wavy, but um, you know, if you are interested on the details, uh, you know, there's other, uh, another talk uh, at a previous PyCon and PyData that you can check out uh, uh, you know, in, in your own time. So what we're going to be doing is we're going to be training a machine learning model, and we're going to be packaging that machine learning model and deploying it. So in this case, it's going to be a scikit-learn model. We're going to be converting it into a fully-fledged microservice that is going to support you know, uh, REST, uh, gRPC, and Kafka calls. But you know, the, the key thing is we're going to be using frameworks that allow us to do this. In this case, we're going to be using this framework called uh, ML Server for the runtime. So it's built on FastAPI and Seldon Core for the orchestration. That's what's going to be happening in, in the background. So let's get started. Um, so that's basically the notebook that, that I was mentioning earlier. What we're going to be doing first is we're going to be using, uh, you know, scikit-learn. Uh, we're going to be using the hello world of machine learning, which is the uh, iris uh, classifier and the iris dataset. So we're going to be training a simple logistic regression model. Uh, and from that, you know, we can see that we've trained it, you know, very simple. And we now have a machine learning model that we can use for inference. So we, if we pass an input, it provides us with the prediction. So what we normally do now, uh, I guess in a production end-to-end uh, -end machine learning lifecycle, we want to persist, persist this machine learning model, right? So we're going to be using our handy uh, pickle, or in this case, joblib, to actually dump that binary. Um, and if actually, let's have a look at what's inside of that binary, just out of curiosity, right? So, so, so if, we, if we just, uh, yeah, I guess let's restart the kernel. And let's rerun that again. And let's have a look inside of the pickle. So inside of the pickle, we actually can see some simple things that we would expect, right? So in this case, it is the module that you're expected to use. This is the scikit-learn uh, logistic module, the logistic regression class, and then the parameters that you want to use to initialize that pickle when you load it from memory, right? So that's basically what you're expected to do. So, so, so far, so good. So now we can actually take this pickle, put it in a remote bucket, right, so that we can actually productionize it. In this case, we're going to be using Minio, which can be S3 or Google Bucket or something like that. And then we're going to be able to deploy it into our local Kubernetes cluster. So this is basically the step that I was mentioning, very hand wavy at this point. But you know, just for the, for the sake of the talk on security, we're going to have to, um, yeah, I guess, uh, skip some steps. So now we can actually see that this uh, artifact that we, that we you know, uh, uploaded into a bucket uh, under the folder uh, fml artifacts slash save, we're going to be able to see that now we have a microservice running. And this microservice, similar to how we consumed it locally, we can now consume it in a remote way. So we send a prediction, which in this case is this input, and then the, the inference response is basically you know, the one hot vector with the uh, second class as being the, the prediction. Right, so we've deployed a model, right? So, so this is uh, the stage where you know, we, we, we've done our job, we're happy, we can go to the pub, uh, but the reality is, is that the life cycle of the model really begins once it's trained and once it's generating value. And you know, in other talks that I link, we talk about other things like monitoring, but in this case, let's talk about security. And when it comes to actually uh, security considerations, if we look at the steps that we carried out, you know, this is the traditional uh, you know, ML pipeline, right? So data cleansing, uh, uh, feature engineering, then model training, you know, several iterations, and then once you're ready, persist the model, and then deploy it, and then monitor it. So if we ask the question, if, you know, looking at this end-to-end -end machine learning lifecycle, where are the areas that you, know, you would imagine are susceptible for uh, potential security vulnerabilities? Right? So if we have a think, uh, those are the ones highlighted uh, in red, right? So every single stage of our machine learning lifecycle can be uh, uh, exposed to a security vulnerability, right? And this is something that we have to be conscious about uh, when, when going through this talk, is that uh, there will have to be uh, processes that you can introduce, but also 
making them proportionate to the risk that is involved, right? If it's only one data scientist, the amount of like, you know, overhead and automation would be less than if it's a team of you know, 20 data scientists with three machine learning engineers with one DevOps engineer that is like, you know, producing models at scale. So now let's actually look at each of those stages of the machine learning life cycle and see how each stage can be exploited. So we're gonna be looking at um, you know, some potential vulnerabilities at the loading of the models, of the artifacts, um, access to the model and uh, you know, potential uh, issues uh, in that front, uh, issues with dependencies and supply chain management, uh, code vulnerabilities, model runtime images, and then some honorable mentions on infrastructure. So let's start with the first part. So in, in, in the crowd here, who has used a pickle? Raise your hand. Okay, so uh, for the video, it's about 90% uh, have, have used pickles. So we all love pickles, right? Uh, we use them on a day-to-day -day basis. Should we use them? I don't know, maybe, should we, maybe we shouldn't use them as, as, as ubiquitously as we are. So let's have a look at, at so, some of the challenges when, 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 when it comes to, to pickles themselves. So let's take that pickle that we dumped, that binary that we dumped, and let's load it back into memory. We can see that it still works, right? If we run a prediction, it still, it still works. But now if we actually look at what's happening and how Python interacts with pickles, the way that Python interacts is through the redu reduce function. And in this case, what we can do is we can inject our, our own reduce function to tell Python how we want it to, to handle with this pickle, right? In this case, what we can do is we can just make it run uh, return the package os.system and this command, which is like a base64 string, which is going to be just taking all of the environment and putting it into a file called pon.txt. But this could be anything else, right? It could be pulling the Kubernetes secrets, sending them over an email. You can run any you know, command that you want to run. So let's actually put that and let's inject it into our class. Now what we can do is we can dump that unsafe model, that model that we are now calling unsafe, and then when we actually look at the pickle, it's a little bit different, right? Instead of seeing the scikit-learn module and all of the, the things that we were expecting, we can see that system module and then this command, which basically says take the environment and put it in a pawn.txt file, right? So unaware of this, uh, you know, we are deploying our model. We can see that now our models uh, that are deployed, so now we actually have our safe and our unsafe model. And we, if we look at the inside of the, of the container itself, we can see that that pawn.txt file was created. So that code is running. And if we now actually try to load that pickle locally, we can see that the pawn.txt is created locally. Right? So, so basically, when loading this pickle, we're executing uh, this uh, uh, you know, arbitrary, uh, potentially malicious code, uh, which you know, re re really, we, we, we shouldn't be doing that. Um, so, so now you have a bit of an intuition. And you know, fortunate, unfortunately, you know, uh, but also with, with a lot of uh, you know, understanding, a lot of uh, you know, libraries that we love and, and, and use on a day-to-day -day basis use uh, this standard or you know, even uh, suggest this standard or use this standard internally uh, for um, you know, the artifacts themselves. So then this raises the question of like, well, you know, what should, what should be done for this specific context? Should we introduce some like super smart type systems that allows us to scan pickles for vulner uh, vulnerabilities? Well, you know, the best practice tends to be similar to general uh, containers or loading any type of binary code uh, from any resource is the concept of trust or discard, right? Um, you know, similar to Docker images, you know, you need to make sure that the uh, location where you're running, where you're fetching those containers that have arbitrary code, or not arbitrary, but like the, the, the have potentially arbitrary code, you know, you can trust those, those locations. And of course, you also can trust the pipelines that generate those artifacts, right? So if that, that CI CD pipeline is compromised, then you may be compromised, you know, down the stream in different areas. So we're going to revisit some of these points. The second part uh, that we're going to now talk about is access to the model, on unrestricted access to the model. So if we deploy a model and we don't restrict the access, that means that malicious players would be able to access and, and consume that model uh, to their own liking. And one of the interesting areas that we have seen is the concept of adversarial attack. So this is basically being able to generate adversarial examples that can trick the machine learning model whilst also tricking a human. So we actually have uh, an interesting example that you can try out with one of an open source libraries called Alibi Detect. So this shows you not only how to create adversarial examples, but also how to create an adversarial detector, right? So that you can put some sort of like, you know, uh, advanced monitoring component to identify if an example itself, an input is, is, is adversarial. So and here you can actually see how some of the adversarial uh, examples can be created, and you can also see how those can be used to trick uh, the machine learning model themselves. So that's, that's one interesting thing that I would want to point you out and for you to try it out. 
The second one is that if you have access, unrestricted access to the model artifact itself, it is also, uh, there's also interesting literature that shows how it's possible to extract the training data from you know, things like large language models themselves. So this is another consideration uh, that may you know, raise potential privacy, uh, data privacy and data leakage uh, challenges when it comes to unrestricted access to the model. So that's one, one, one key consideration. Moving to the next part is code, right? We tend to forget that as practitioners, maybe we are writing Jupyter notebooks, and we may think, well, that's actually you know, not the same as like, writing a web application. But once it gets to a, a, a certain um, you know, I guess, uh, uh, use or scale, that actually becomes code or analogous to code itself, and it has the same potential challenges that you would find with normal uh, software that you have. So code, code scan tools are very useful for those type of situations, and especially because we have seen in some contexts some uh, of the vulnerabilities that have been highlighted. I don't know if people here uh, remember about the um, yeah, vulnerability in the, Pi, in, the, in, the, in the Pi YAML package. Uh, so that actually affected a lot of libraries. And you know, this is a, a, an example that you know, practitioners in the data science space may not be aware of, of that. So uh, you know, from, from code scans, you can use a lot of uh, really interesting tools. Um, you know, we, we actually show how you can use tools like Bandit. So Bandit allows you to actually uh, search across your Python project and identify any vulnerabilities, low, medium, large, et cetera, um, for that. So now on the, on the next you know, highlight is making sure that you know, this also is encompassed for Jupyter Notebooks. Um, now, dependencies are important. Right now, there's a lot of discussion about the supply chain vulnerabilities. So if you pull a, a dependency in Python and you pin your dependencies, that doesn't mean that your second, third, fourth level dependencies are going to be pinned. And we actually, these are actually vulnerable to supply chain attacks. We have actually seen a lot of cases recently where you know, PyPy packages have been compromised and you know, maintainers may actually uh, end up in a situation where that is like a fifth, seventh level dependency and that may be highlighted. So it's important to be able to address this and we actually have worked with some projects like MLflow uh, to ensure that you know, some of these uh, things that were done dynamically of pulling dependencies now is actually done at once. And one of the things that we often uh, try to emphasize is for dependency scans, there's a lot of tools that you can leverage, right? So one of them is safety. So that's like a Python package that you can leverage and also other packages like pip depth dep tree uh, to be able to identify what are all of the dependencies that you have. Now, there is tools also like poetry that allow you to create lock files, which basically you know, means that you can have an understanding of you know, all of your second, third, fourth level dependencies so that you have like fully reproducible environments. So this is an example of a poetry.lock file. So th there are a lot of resources, and that is the emphasis that right now as practitioners you can leverage. And you know, recently this was a conversation I had with one of uh, my teammates, you know, highlighting some of the challenges where everything was working on a Friday and it got broken on a Monday when nothing changed. Uh, finally, the last part is on image scans. So this is one important thing, especially for us, that we have to carry out um, you know, the deployment of, of these uh, you know, servers so that people can deploy their models. Uh, we actually have to run the automation of these scans with every release, and we use tools like Privy that you can leverage yourself. So this is like you know a, a free tool uh, that you can you know uh, leverage in your own CI/CD pipeline, and you can search for uh, CVEs across your image. So for example, you know this morning we identify a CVE, and we had to just rerun the image build uh, to address it with the latest uh, package. So that is that is a set of examples. You know, this is of course a Python uh, conference, so I'm not going to bore you with Kubernetes-related uh, shenanigans. But it is equally important to have some of those, uh, you know, components in your infrastructure, right? And that means things like uh, encryption on data in transit, in uh, data at rest, as well as authentication, authorization, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now, if we actually look back at some of those components that we that we defined initially with the OWASP top 10, we can now define. Uh, what well, we can call the o OMLSP, right? The o Open Machine Learning uh, Standards Project. And we have some of those one-to-one -one mappings between things like broken access control to access to model endpoints, cryptographic failures to um, access to model ar artifacts, et cetera, et cetera. And we've actually kicked off a, 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 an initiative within the Linux Foundation to define some of these things through a machine, learn, a machine learning security committee. So again, this is more of a call to action to emphasize that we're currently all looking to build those best practices. Now, I didn't want to stand here and just like raise problems. I also wanted to uh, you know, emphasize that we are also trying to find some solutions and best practices. So we created a, um, I guess, uh, 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 analogous repo to the flawed machine learning security, so the FML uh, repo, which is called uh, SML, so Safe uh, Machine Learning Security. 
uh, which is basically a base template that you can use to generate a starter, uh, I guess, machine learning engineering package. And what that means is that you can just basically like start it uh, like such. You basically, uh, you know, just run with cookie cutter. It's like a template generation project. Let's call it like example project. Uh, then you know you put things like your your, your repo username, uh, the name of the project, the number of the name of the classes, the description, the license that you want to use, and that basically will generate you that base project. And the base project itself, what that would have is it would end up with you know a base server together with the dependency package management, the scans for security that you can run as part of your CI, as well as you know your runtime environment that you can leverage to package your machine learning model using this framework called ML Server. So the ones that we were using uh, as, part of this, uh, as part of this talk. So just to wrap up on some of the things that we've covered, um, if we take a step back, we've talked about technology, but it's important to make sure that human and process is heavily involved. When we look at production machine learning systems, the architectural blueprints always have similar steps of experimentation, taking training data to train models and create artifacts, the sort of automation or, or manual deployment of models, uh, whether it's CI/CD or, or through you know, pipelines, to create you know, running either batch or real-time models, advanced monitoring components for the, for the uh, you know, things that we mentioned like adversarial uh, robustness, adversarial detection, drift detection, outlier detection, and then making sure that there's full continuity with some of the data that is part of that. The processes are important as each of these areas as you have a data scientist that is creating those models. You have a machine learning engineer that is creating those use case automation pipelines and then making sure that there are also those deployment pipelines so that you can have the inference up across your, your, your models as well as the, the DevOps personas that would be involved. And security is not just about tools, it's about the processes that have to be uh, integrated, but also that are proportionate to the maturity of your organization and the risk of the use case, right? If you are just building a small prototype with perhaps just a hand, you know, a small group of uh, you know, uh, practitioners, the actual process can be enforced just within this unit, but as it grows, standardization, uh, you know, centralization, control of the production environment starts becoming more important, as well as role-based access control control for the, for the data that flows. So for anyone that is interested in deeper dives, I know that a lot of the deployment stuff was very hand wavy. There are other talks uh, to deep dive into things like CI CD for production machine learning, for machine learning monitoring, for machine learning acceleration, et cetera, et cetera. So please uh, do have a look. Uh, and just a reminder, you can find all of the resources in the Git repo and the slides uh, at the link, at the bit.ly link on the top right. So with that, thank you everybody, and I hope uh, you enjoy the talk. So I'll pause for questions now. Awesome. So if there's, all right, I guess people coming to the mic. Yes, uh, thank you uh, for the talk. Uh, yeah, you mentioned the trust is important to have a trusted pipeline that generates the, the model the binary, let's say. But actually, uh, that's uh, nowadays inverted, that uh, it's important to have zero trust. You know? So uh, can you maybe talk a little bit closer to the mic? Well, you say it's about trust, right? The trusted pipeline that generates a trusted binary in that sense. But I think nowadays security is actually more about zero trust. Because you know? if you trust the system, then you are open to attack. So it's more about verifying your security instead of assuming it. You know? Yeah, I mean, that sounds more like a, like a thought or a comment. Yeah. I mean, I, I agree. I think, I think when it comes to um, yeah, security, there are probably like two parts to this. One is just having a baseline of best practice. And the other one is, as you mentioned, verification, you know, over testing itself. But I think a lot of these concepts probably focus more on the, on the former, which is just uh, what are the basic uh, set of uh, minimum best practices that machine learning projects should be conscious of, um, you know, as, it, as, as, as you're dealing with uh, scale, uh, especially with more uh, critical use cases. So, so yeah, I mean, uh, I, I would agree. Yeah, and I mean, you don't have any suggestion what would mean model binary verification then, or because I mean, you can. Uh, it's more the subject that you touched, but not really any uh, guidelines. You know. Yeah, no, I, I think I think I think it goes back to that point that was made uh, on emphasizing trust or discard. I mean, I think it is possible to go into a sort of like you know exploration of advanced methods to be able to verify the binaries themselves. 
But you know, it's the same sort of paradigm that you have with things like Docker containers. You're still going to be pulling things that are analogous to um, you know, components that have uh, uh, code that would be executed. So you have kind of a, limit, a limited amount of how much verification you're going to do throughout each of these areas. So yeah, I think the main emphasis at this point is more that trust or discard mechanism. There are some interesting projects that explore actually binary, like pickle scanning, uh, specifically in the machine learning space. But again, those are still in the very early exploratory phases. All right. Cheers. Hello, hello. Thanks for the uh, talk. So we talked about dependencies. And one thing, particular thing that happens with machine learning right now is that everyone builds their own model. But now with the large language models, we're moving to have another models as dependencies and fine tuning other models into uh, a new one and then over and over again. But what happens someone to ma from someone from manipulate instead of fine tuning, manipulating those parameters uh, to trigger not really, perhaps not uh, remote execution or whatever, but um, unintended side effects on the execution of those parameters of that uh, prediction. The challenge here is that when you do dependency scanning or you go through dependencies, upgrade dependencies, you still have a track of what was changed on those dependencies. And that doesn't exist anymore on, it's not as human readable anymore on the machine learning side because you only see numbers changing. You don't see it's a lot more similar to, I don't know, uh, assembly code being changed on the thing. How do you see this uh, in a few years from now when machine learning becomes as much as building software uh, where you depend on a lot of dependencies of machine, other machine learning models instead of just like building your own all, all the time? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I mean, I would say that that's the case now. Um, you know, we, we see that uh, already uh, causing, um, introducing risks in production. So the tool that I was showing you, uh, Seldon Core, so that allows you to deploy inference graphs with multiple stages. So you can have like, you know, preprocessors, postprocessors, each of them with like different versions, different frameworks, different libraries. Um, I think that, it, that is why right now there is such an important, such, such a critical emphasis on, start, on, on thinking about the best practices around security. So although I agree that, um, you know, it does become quite um, almost impossible to, to, to go into the, uh, you know, code specific change uh, across every sort of like, uh, you know, dependency modification throughout your supply chain. Um, that's why it is important to leverage some of the best practices that have been created in the software side, which is leveraging things like uh, CVE scanning and CVE databases. So that actually keeps track of some of the co common vulnerabilities, exploits, as well as remediations. And that is something that will only grow in the machine learning space, making sure that Perhaps even some of those CVEs are tailored specific to, to machine learning type use cases, perhaps even for things like adversarial robustness or you know, perhaps even like privacy preserving areas um, that, that may result in, in risk. Um, so it, it, it's more about bringing what is already uh, being used in practice in production as opposed to reinventing the wheel. So that's what I would uh, suggest. And, and that's how we are approaching it, right? That's why we, we were taking the OWASP and trying to see, well, what do we take? What do we leave? What, 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 what needs to be rethought? Mm -hmm. Thanks. Hey, uh, thanks also from my side. Um, I have a question about um, the possibility to reverse engineer machine learning models. Because um, I often hear people being afraid, especially when dealing with sensitive data, um, that they are afraid of the possibility of reverse engineering the machine learning model or even the data itself that it was used with. And I was wondering if you have any insights on that. Yeah, absolutely. So, so I think that was one of the, the, the research papers that yeah, was linked here that, that you may be quite interested about. So, so this one actually explores that exactly, is, is reverse engineering, um, I guess, training data from, from large language models. Uh, which, you know, in, in some cases may uh, uh, include uh, potentially uh, personally identifiable data or, or uh, you know, critical data. So th this is certainly a risk. And I think that is why it's important to emphasize that when it comes to security, it's not just about, you know, verification of, a, of an artifact at a particular point in time. It's making sure that, you know, you're leveraging best practices throughout your entire operational uh, touch points with the stakeholders that are involved. 
right? That your CI pipeline is, is, is robust, is, um, it has a relevant role-based access control, it has the relevant practitioners um, you know, in, involved in the development and extension of that. Uh, and in the same way uh, for the management of artifacts, making sure that those uh, are uh, uh, you know, restricted in terms of access, uh, similar to how you have restriction of access for, for data, especially critical data. So it's just introducing those best practices, but um, to the broader set of uh, artifacts that are involved in the machine learning uh, life cycles. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, all right, guys. That was that was an amazing session and a very insightful Q and A. But unfortunately, we're on time, so like we're just run out of time. So guess uh, you guys can move into the coffee area and like ask more questions over coffee. So thank you. Yeah.